This Sunday, a change at the Supreme Court. This is sort of a bittersweet day for me. The announced retirement of Justice Stephen Breyer. People have come to accept this Constitution, and they've come to accept the importance of the rule of law. Gives President Biden a chance to make an historic appointment. And that person will be the first black woman ever nominated to the United States Supreme Court. And a reignite enthusiasm among disappointed core Democratic voters. Biden has the votes, so will Republicans still try to fight this nomination? They're trying to use this to distract from what is their failed agenda. Plus, Russia moves more troops to Ukraine's border. I think you'd have to go back quite a while into the Cold War days to see something of this magnitude. Pentagon officials say Russia now has enough troops to move far into Ukraine, sparking fears of a much wider conflict. My guests this morning, Democratic Senator Dick Durbin and Republican Senator Rob Portman. Also COVID, despite spikes in some states. Things are sort of at un unprecedented levels. Cases are now heading down in all regions of the country, even as a new Omicron variant emerges. I think another major wave is really unlikely out of this summer. I'll talk to two governors, Democrat Phil Murphy of New Jersey and Republican Asa Hutchinson of Arkansas, about the fight against COVID and how they're dealing with America's political divide. Joining me for insight and analysis are NBC News White House correspondent Carol Lee, Eugene Scott of The Washington Post, former Democratic Senator Claire McCaskill, and Stephen Hayes, founder of The Dispatch. Welcome to Sunday. It's Meet the Press. From NBC News in Washington, the longest running show in television history, this is Meet the Press with Chuck Todd. And a good Sunday morning. Just last week, we said President Biden was in desperate need of a reset. His poll numbers are falling, in particular among African Americans. And there's real fear that Democrats' midterm hopes will be sunk by a lack of enthusiasm among the very voters who put Mr. Biden in office. And then just like that, Mr. Biden was thrown a lifeline with the news that Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer would indeed retire at the end of this term. President Biden vowed to keep his promise during the campaign that he would appoint an African American woman to the first court opening he had. That could help with declining black support. Supreme Court hearings could also blunt that enthusiasm problem, serving as a reminder to Democrats that elections have consequences and they matter. And getting a Supreme Court nominee confirmed would give Mr. Biden a political win after the disappointments in the last few months over voting rights and Build Back Better. Of course, replacing Breyer with another liberal won't change the court's current conservative tilt. But Mr. Biden finally has an open field with a real chance to put some points on the board and at least temporarily change the narrative of his presidency. It's long overdue. President Biden previewing his Supreme Court pick on Thursday, hoping to regain political momentum after a difficult month. The person I will nominate will be someone with extraordinary qualifications, character, experience, and integrity. And that person will be the first black woman ever nominated to the United States Supreme Court. Mr. Biden's approval rating among African Americans has dropped nearly 20 points since April to just 64 percent. Do you think President Biden has done enough for black women voters? I really don't. Now he has the chance to show he can keep his campaign promises. I'm looking forward to making sure there's a black woman on the Supreme Court. This is a promise that he made and a promise that will be kept. Among the likely contenders, Katanji Brown Jackson of the Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. She's a former Breyer law clerk, 51, and has twice been confirmed by the Senate, including once by this Senate. I'm not injecting my personal views. I'm even-handedly applying the law. Leandra Kruger, a justice on California's state Supreme Court. She clerked for Justice John Paul Stevens. She's 45 and was a deputy in the Solicitor General's office during the Obama administration, arguing a dozen cases before the Supreme Court. And J. Michelle Childs, a federal judge in South Carolina, Recently nominated to the Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, she's 55 and close with Jim Clyburn. She's not an Ivy Leaguer. She got a bachelor's degree uh, from the uh, University of South Florida. She got a Jewish doctorate uh, from the University of South Carolina, her master's in law from Duke University. She's thoroughly Southern. The Supreme Court vote, which now requires a simple majority in the Senate, will give Biden a victory after months featuring party divisions on Senate rules, voting rights, and the president's economic plan, Build Back Better. While some conservatives would like to take an aggressive approach... This is a hard, woke left administration. The irony is that the Supreme Court is at the very same time hearing cases about uh, 
about this sort of affirmative racial <laughs> discrimination. Yes. And, 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 and while adding someone who is the beneficiary of, uh, of this sort of quota. Without the votes to block a nomination, most Senate Republicans are signaling they will stay focused on high prices. Rampant inflation. Incredible inflation. A 40-year high of inflation in the United States. Meanwhile, the White House hopes this vote will fire up disappointed progressives. When you don't change people's lives, people get upset. And remind Democrats of the Supreme Court fights to come, including the likelihood that the court will limit or eliminate protections for abortion rights. This is going to be a massive issue at the ballot boxes. There's just no question about it. There's going to be rage. But with inflation a drag on at-risk Democrats, the question is how much even a Supreme Court appointment can break through. Where's the war room on the cost of living? And joining me now is the number two Senate Democrat and chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Dick Durbin of Illinois. Senator Durbin, welcome back to Meet the Press. Thanks, Chuck. You'll be overseeing this confirmation process for uh, whoever the president ends up selecting. Uh, and before we get into some specific names, I want to get into a couple of numbers here. Amy Coney Barrett, 27 days from uh, nomination to confirmation. Sonia Sotomayor, 66 days from nomination to confirmation. I know you decried the speed of what happened with Amy Coney Barrett. And there's a lot of things that you want to decry on that. What should we expect timeline-wise? Closer to Sonia Sotomayor or closer to Amy Coney Barrett? Well, a great deal depends on the nominee. If the person has been before the committee uh, seeking approval for a circuit court, then the committee knows quite a bit about the, that person, and uh, that can be taken into consideration. Uh, if there are no new developments for someone who's been before the committee <clears throat> in, pre in the previous uh, year or two, uh, it makes a real difference. Uh, I can just say this. It's going to be fair, it's going to be deliberate, and we're going to be timely about it, too. This is a lifetime appointment to the highest court in the land. We should take it seriously. Look, I, I am obviously going to try to pin you down one more time on timing. Easter recess, mid-April. Is that a fair target at this point to get it done before well, you guys the, take off before, or do you think probably just by after? By the Amy... Well, by the Amy Coney Barrett test, yes, it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we'll see. We'll see what develops. And a great deal, maybe all of it, depends on the nominee and the background of the nominee. You said something just interesting to me just now. You said it depends if they've been before a committee before. Uh, Katanji Brown-Jackson, obviously on the circuit, on the D.C. circuit, she has been before this committee. This Senate has received 53 votes. Uh, based on what you have, what you know about her, do you think, she should be the front runner for this post. I sure don't want to speculate on that. Uh, the White House made it clear when they told me about the Breyer vacancy that they had not, or the president had not made the decision. And I want to respect that. I think uh, suggesting there's a front runner or uh, this person is now moving ahead, it's unfair to all the nominees. This is in the hands of the president as it should be. What kind of conversations have you had with the ranking member, Lindsey Graham, about what kind of process this is going to be? Or are, are relations just sort of, eh, it's just not how it works anymore? Well, uh, I, I would say that the ranking member is now the senator from Iowa. Oh, sorry, my apologies. Uh, there. I That's called right. him. Yeah. I, I called him the next day. We had a brief conversation about it. Uh, and I have a good working relationship with Senator Grassley. Uh, we really trust one another. I, I, I like him, and I hope he likes me as much. Uh, and I think we're going to do our best to serve our country uh, in this capacity. Uh, he's been through it. I've been through it for seven of the current Supreme Court justices. Uh, I would suggest he might even be for, in for a longer uh, term uh, and has uh, really faced them all. So we do have experience on the subject. You know, it's interesting here. Clarence Thomas is about to become the only member of the current Supreme Court, who was nominated by a president of one party and confirmed by a Senate controlled by the other party. You think we'll see that again in our lifetime? Well, and think back about Stephen Breyer. Here's a man who worked as the chief assistant to Ted Kennedy. And when his vote came up uh, in the Senate, he was approved 87 to 9. Uh, it, it's an indication of the good old days when there was much more bipartisanship. But, but my goal is to make sure that we have a, a deliberate, timely hearing, but also to reach out to the Republican side and see if they can join us in making it a bipartisan nomination. I think that speaks well of the court and it speaks well of the Senate if we can achieve it. I want to ask about one other aspect to the Supreme Court nominees that has become sort of now the norm. 
Uh, it's something Jonathan Chait wrote about New York Magazine, because it's always about age now. Neither party would choose a nominee over the age of 60, even though the most accomplished judges, by definition, have been honing their craft for a long time. The absurd actuarial logic of lifetime appointments incentivizes both parties to find the youngest possible nominee who can plausibly be sold to the public as having cleared the qualification bar. It is sort of a conundrum here that we, are, we do rush these folks onto the judiciary if we think, you know, both parties do it, if we think they have the qualifications to get on the Supreme Court. Are we choosing age too quickly these days? It's a factor. I'm not going to mislead you in, in the selection of judges at every level. Yeah, I have a lot of uh, my friends here in Chicago who are attorneys in their 60s who would like to cap off their career by right. being a federal judge. It doesn't really make sense. You know, when you consider how little time they're likely to serve before they reach senior status or leave completely, uh, we do look for younger candidates, uh, younger by uh, right. Supreme Court and federal court standards. But it, it's it's done on both sides. I don't think there's any surprise that both of the, uh, the Republicans right. and Democrats would like some longevity in the service. I want to turn to the issue of Ukraine. Uh, both you and my other Republican guests uh, our chair of the Ukrainian Senate caucus, if you will, Senators Portman and yourself, both have large Ukrainian populations in your states. And I'm curious of what you thought of what President Zelensky said on Friday. He seemed to wonder aloud why Russia hasn't been punished yet. You know, that there, he's a little concerned that we are waiting, that it looks like we are waiting until after he encroaches on the border of Ukraine, not before. What would you say to him? Well, I would just say to President Zelensky, we need to accept one basic premise. Any decision about the future of Ukraine will be made by Ukraine. It won't be made in Moscow or in Washington, in the European Union or in Belarus. It's their future and their fate and their decision uh, as far as that is concerned. I, I have listened closely to what President Zelensky has said, and I, I, he reminds us time and again that uh, there could be a way out of this short of military action. And I hope there is, but it's his decision to make. If he decides that the future membership, if there's to be one in NATO for Ukraine and the question of Russian occupation of Ukraine are two things to put on the table, uh, I think we may move toward a solution to this, and I hope we do soon. That's interesting. You think he may accept some limitations on his relationship with NATO? I don't want to presume a thing, nothing. It's his decision entirely. But as I listen to the diplomacy back mm -hmm. and forth, it seems to me that the Russians want to try to delay any U uh, Ukraine involvement in NATO. And Ukraine, of course, wants the Russians out. I'm not talking just about the troops at the border, right. but those that invaded their country seven or eight years ago. And currently the little green men, or however they characterize right. them, continue the, the warfare and killing. That's a pretty optimistic note you're sounding here. You really think this is going to we're going to have a diplomatic exit here. Well, uh, we better be prepared for the worst. And I think the president is uh, right. stiffening our resolve to face that if we have to with uh, serious sanctions and our NATO uh, forces uh, doing everything they can to protect the Baltics and Poland and right. other countries. But, you know, I, I do like the fact that the diplomacy continues. And, and that, to me, is an encouraging sign. Senator Dick Durbin, Democrat from Illinois, the number two in the Senate, head of the Judiciary Committee. We'll be seeing a lot of you as these hearings get started. Thanks for coming on and sharing your perspective with us, sir. Thanks, Chuck. And joining me now is Republican Senator Rob Portman of Ohio. Senator Portman, welcome back to Meet the Press. Thanks, Chuck. And as I noted, you and, you and Senator Durbin head the Senate Ukrainian Caucus, and you were recently in country, met with President Zelensky. And I kind of want to pick up there on the conversation I just stopped with with Senator Durbin. Uh, do you share this uh, this sense that Zelensky, that Ukraine itself might be willing to limit its interest in NATO uh, as a de-escalation tool with the Russians. Is that a viable diplomatic solution here? Well, look, it's, it's up to NATO and up to Ukraine. Uh, NATO has an open-door policy, and we have to continue to defend that. Uh, so I, 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 don't, I don't think that's something that, that we're going to decide. Uh, I, I will say two things. One, Dick Durbin and I are co-chairs of this caucus, and we have been unified as Republicans and Democrats in standing up to what Russia has done, both what they did with regard to Crimea uh, seven, eight years ago and the Donbass region. In other words, they've already invaded Ukraine twice. Mm -hmm. 
and certainly now, while Ukraine is massing this un unwarranted and very intimidating force all along the, the border, it's not just the eastern border now, but the northern border and, and, and elsewhere. So we are together. Second, we're looking at putting together a strong package, which I hope we can pass next week, which would include sanctions, which would include more military assistance, which would include helping them to fight back against the cyber attacks that the Russians uh, continue uh, to use against Ukraine and also to help on the disinformation campaign that Russia is actively involved in to try to destabilize the Zelensky government. So this right now, Chuck, in Ukraine is yeah. where the cause of freedom is being waged in our generation. And, and we need to stand up and be unified uh, with our allies and as Democrats and Republicans. I want to see if you can explain maybe what Zelensky is saying publicly and perhaps what he's saying privately. Uh, during his press conference on Friday, he was a bit critical of some Western leaders, including President Biden, feeling as if they're talking up war too much. Here's what he said. It's a bit of the translation. These signals were sent by uh, respected leaders of their respected countries. Sometimes they're not even using diplomatic language. They think tomorrow is the war. This means panic on the market, panic in the financial sector. Obviously, he's concerned about his economy. At the same time, he was asking you, we need more weapons. He wishes our sanctions would be imposed before Russia invaded uh, is he saying one thing behind the scenes and saying one thing for public consumption? Well, look, he's got a, a slightly different constituency than, than President Biden. President Biden's uh, job is to mobilize our allies, mobilize America to be prepared for the possibility that Vladimir Putin will make a huge mistake uh, and put together consequences that will be devastating to try to avoid that from happening. Uh, President Zelensky obviously is trying to uh, maintain his economic growth in his country, which, by the way, is, is pretty strong right now, and, and keep the country from panicking while having them be prepared. But we're together. That's what's important. As to Russia and what Russia is doing, uh, the Ukrainians and, and the Americans are absolutely together. But so are so many other allies, really mm -hmm. the entire free world. It's, it's been very impressive uh, as I look at what Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, the Baltics, and, and Finland, and Denmark, and uh, you know, countries like Canada and the UK uh, have done. I mean, our, our alliance is incredibly strong. One thing Vladimir Putin has done successfully is he has strengthened the transatlantic alliance. And, and it's countries around the world who are looking at this and saying, we cannot let this stand. We cannot let this happen. For the first time in nearly 80 years since World War II, we could have a major conflict with, uh, and a very bloody conflict yeah. uh, in, in Europe unless we stand up together and, and push back. And, and so far, so good. We're doing that. My hope is that Vladimir Putin will see that and realize that the consequences will be devastating for him. By the way, Chuck, the other thing that it was interesting yeah. in being there is that the, the commitment and the patriotism of the Ukrainians. Yeah. You know, I, I've been at the line of contact. I was there in 2014 after this revolution of dignity. And Ukrainians feel a very strong sense of nationalism. And, and they're going to fight. Senator, you're speaking very optimistically about the Western alliance. Germany hasn't exactly been, um, let's say, as aggressive as perhaps the rest of the Western alliance would be, whether it's on shipping uh, weapons or on dealing with this Nord Stream pipeline. Are you confident that if, if uh, Russia invades, Germany will be on board cutting off the Nord Stream pipeline? Well, apparently they're saying that privately. Uh, they should say it publicly. Um, I'm also, as you know, a little disappointed in their inability to approve arms sales. Uh, if something was made in, in Germany, in this case uh, in East Germany, they made howitzers that are now uh, with the Estonians. The Estonians want to provide it to Ukraine. Ukraine wants these, these howitzers, which are older equipment, but important for them. Uh, and these are artillery weapons that the Ukrainians need badly. And yet Germany is not approving it. That makes no sense to me. And I've made that very clear uh, in conversations uh, with the Germans yeah. and others. So my, my hope is that Germany will step forward even more. But, but they're, they're with us. Uh, they're saying that they would yeah. cut off Nord Stream 2 pipeline should there be a, 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 an invasion of any, any type. And uh, I certainly hope that's true. I want to ask about Republican unity on this issue. Uh, i got to play you a clip here from Tucker Carlson, which has been leading more and more Republicans, rank-and-file Republicans, to question what we're doing with Russia and Ukraine. Here's what he said. At this point, NATO exists primarily to torment Vladimir Putin, who, whatever his many faults, has no intention of invading Western Europe. Vladimir Putin does not want Belgium. He just wants to keep his Western border secure. I'm sure you love being asked about a cable TV news host, but it has led quite a bit of <laughs> rank and file Americans to to ask this question. I mean, are you worried that there is a movement 
in the Republican Party that has become pro-Putin? Well, I wouldn't call it a movement, but I think we've got to be sure we're understanding what's going on here. The Ukrainians are not asking for American troops uh, to come to Ukraine. And I've gotten a number of phone calls from some of these uh, uh, cable news shows saying, you know, we've got to keep our troops out of there. They're not asking for our troops, nor is anybody uh, talking about that. We are talking about strengthening the countries around the region who are looking for more help, NATO countries uh, like the Baltics, like Poland. Uh, second, Again, this is about the fight for freedom. I mean, this is a country that has decided that they want to be like us. They want to be a democracy. Uh, they want to respect the rule of law. Mm -hmm. They want to have a free enterprise system that's strong and vibrant. Uh, this has all happened in the last eight years. And, and they have turned to the EU and turned to mm -hmm. the United States and said, we want to be part of the West. And by the way, every year, Chuck, it's becoming more and more evident that that's where the people of Ukraine are, which is, I think, one reason why Vladimir Putin is moving now, because right. he sees it falling away toward the West. America always stands for freedom. You know, we, we are the country that believes that okay. people's free will ought to be respected, that sovereignty matters, that, inter right. uh, that the, 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 the dignity of the Ukrainian people matters, and this is what they want. So their territorial integrity is at risk right now, and it's appropriate that the yeah. free world stand by them. Senator Portman, uh, Republican from Ohio who happens to be retiring. Uh, I was going to make you do your icky shuffle today. I have Claire McCaskill on the panel. <laughs> she has her chief's mask. So I'll tell her to do an icky shuffle if you guys pull yeah. the upset. How's that? I, I've got my Bengals tie on today, and I, I, right. I, I did wear a Bengals mask down in Nashville <laughs> last weekend. But uh, We shall see. Day. So there you go. Go Bengals. All right. Senator Portman, thanks for coming on and sharing your thanks, perspective Chuck. with us. When we come back, Take will care. President Biden's chance to replace Stephen Breyer on the Supreme Court give him the political lift he and his party so desperately need? And let's go. Welcome back. Panel is here. As I mentioned, Chiefs fan and former Democratic Senator Claire McCaskill. You've got to work on that icky shuffle. Uh, NBC Yo. News White House correspondent Carol Lee, Eugene Scott of The Washington Post, and Stephen Hayes, founder of The Dispatch and a new member of the NBC News family. Your peacock cufflinks are in the mail. Uh, Very good. Uh, there. Uh, Carol Lee, uh, we've said this was a lifeline politically for the president. Mm -hmm. Uh, did you notice a change in the White House posture this week? Absolutely. I mean, Chuck, this, they see this as a reset, a moment to reset. If you think about just the timing of it, it comes a week after those divisions over the voting rights legislation. And so when you talk to White House officials, they cast this as an opportunity to rally the party, to kind of take a breath, remind everybody to why their what their goals are and to come together and be unified. And they see two moments where this could be particularly energizing. Obviously, right now, when they have this opportunity, um, the president's going to go through the process of picking someone. And then the moment when they have a name and somebody that the party can can really rally behind. Now, in terms of politically going forward, they don't see this as a, you know, something sure. that's going to define the midterms. It'll be a line or two in a speech. But for now, it allows them to take a breath, talk about quietly about how they get, figure out a path forward on some of the president's legislative agendas, while also putting forward a, a unified front after having all these divisions. Eugene, this is a promise made, and he wants to make it a promise kept. I want to put up these statistics just so people understand why uh, I think so many people believe it's about time for an African-American woman on the high court. There are over nearly 1,400 federal judges, just 51 of them right now are African-American women. Right? That's less than 4% of everybody. So it's an underrepresented group as it is in the federal judiciary. The importance of this to African-Americans getting this representation on the court. It's significant. Uh, as, as you noted, this is an area in the judiciary that black women have not seen someone who looks like them. But to your notes earlier, it's also important just for people who have a high view of diversity and believe that representation matters. And so many of these constituents were key players in helping Biden get to the White House. So not just black voters, but women, other people of color, progressive liberals, just people who understand that the benches have not looked like the country that so many uh, people find themselves uh, seeing and being represented for in front of these benches. Claire, you've been in these hearings. You've been star of these hearings at times, depending on... Uh, people's point of view. Um, what should we expect? Is this one going to be drama free? I, if I had to guess or die here, I would think Mitch McConnell is not going to want to draw this out. Sometimes the drama around the nomination motivates bases. I 
certainly felt that in 2018. A reverse, right? Yeah. A reverse. Yeah. Um, so I think, um, you know, it's a football day. I'll, I'll give you the over and under is about 53. <laughs> Uh, votes for the nominee in the Senate, maybe 54. If he goes Perhaps with a that non- Rob Portman's or two may get in there, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I think Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski mm-hmm. and potentially Lindsay has been a fairly down the middle voter on right. on Biden nominees. So uh, I think this is, and I do think it's really important to remember when I was a young attorney in the courtrooms of Kansas City, the only woman I'd seen in a black robe was in the church choir. Right. So we we have made progress. In a lot of ways, but not ever have we had a black woman on the Supreme Court. And I am sick and tired of the Republicans going, nye, 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 because Ronald Reagan said, right. I'm putting a woman on the court, and they didn't say boo. Donald Trump said it last year, last time he was in this case. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, it feels like what Roger Wicker did, and maybe he didn't, and I don't know if he knows he intended. Did he actually make it even harder now for Republicans to, to criticize this pick? Because he went in a direction. We don't even know the pick yet. Well, right. I think that's the key point. You need to know who the pick is. You need to, I mean, before we even get to, to predicting votes, it depends who the pick is and when, what her credentials are. We now know that he's going to pick a black woman. We need to know what her credentials are, what she's done. The top three doing. are pretty well credentialed. I would say look very at well okay, qualified. Let me put them up here. Katanji Brown-Jackson, Leandra Kruger is on the California Supreme Court. Michelle Childs is about, about to be on the D.C. Circuit, although they're delaying her since she's up for this. I mean, these are all, everybody here looks, these resumes look like every other Supreme Court. Sure, resume. and there's a list beyond this. Yeah. That includes a lot of very well qualified candidates. I don't think there's a problem with Republicans pointing out that Joe Biden made a political argument when he said, in the context of a campaign after having lost in Iowa and New Hampshire, that he was going to pick a black woman. It helped him. It was a political pro- pronouncement. Republicans are fine making that point. I think they'd be wise to wait to look at the actual credentials and the arguments of the the women who are nominated. And the White House was ready for this. I mean, they are prepared for the Republicans to, to lean in this direction. And they came out with a statement. I hate to say it that way, but like, eager. they are, want to I play mean, the politics. There are yeah. people close to the president, politi- who, political advisors, who do think if Republicans want to pick this fight, it's one they really want to have. It's talk about energizing, in their view. You're smiling on this. Yeah, I think it's. I think this is um, going to be a strong moment for the Biden predis- presidency. I think um, if anybody doesn't understand how important black women are to the Democratic Party, they're mm-hmm. not paying attention. Right. Eugene, what does this do? Should Does this give uh, a Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin a chance to sort of uh, repair their relationship with the Democratic base? It certainly does. And, and that's something that could very well happen, especially with Manchin, who we remember was very critical of the Republicans last time when Amy Coney Barrett was uh, moved forward very close to the presidential election. So uh, and they have a track record of supporting the president when it comes to uh, moving forward his uh, judge pick. So he, they, it would be consistent of them to do that in this situation. And Caroline, timing, how fast does the White House want to do So this? that's what's been interesting. I thought Senator Durbin's comments were interesting because he just didn't really weigh in. What you saw was Senate Majority Leader Schumer come out and say, this is going to be really fast, and other Democrats in the White House say, wait, that's not our timeline. We're going to do a deliberative process. The president wants to consult with a number of senators. White House officials say that's his next step to formally do that. They're going to announce soon an outside Sherpa team that's going to come into the White House to do. And so they want to do uh, to move methodically. If that's fast, they're fine with that, but they want to show that they're doing a very deliberative and thorough process. Claire, would you use this as cover right now so that you can do Build Back Better negotiations behind the scenes without everybody ankle biting? I think there is no reason for this to be put on afterburners in terms of speed, and Mm -hmm. I think the White House realizes that. I think they need to do this flawlessly. They need to make sure that whoever is selected is vetted thoroughly. They need to count some Republican votes before they announce Mm -hmm. her. And I think all that will happen. And the timing of it, I think, late summer would be probably perfect. Oh, so you would let it drag, (laughs) drag's the wrong word, let it methodically play out very publicly. I I think so. I mean, the only thing that I'm not up on right now is... The health of all the members. Right. All the stuff. Um, all the yeah. there that is, I was there just going to say, there there's, risks. there's always yeah. risks. Pretty we don't close. know how to talk about it other than it's called life. It's called life. Right. Anyway. All right. When we come back with COVID cases falling, but deaths still rising, America's governors are on the front lines of that battle. I'm going to talk to two of them. Democratic Governor Phil Murphy of New Jersey, Republican Governor Asa Hutchinson of Arkansas about the fight against COVID and the growing American political divide. And they're actually going to be on set together. It used to not be a big deal. It's a big deal these days. Stick with us. 
Welcome back. There's actually been some welcome good news on COVID recently. The seven-day average of cases has dropped by about a third over the past two weeks, with almost every single state showing a decrease. Deaths, though, remain distressingly high, but they are the lagging indicator and should also soon come down. The country's governors have been on the front lines of this COVID battle, and uh, that battle means they've been at the front lines of our many political divisions. In our recent NBC News poll, 70% of Americans said our differences were likely to grow compared to just 27% who agreed that while we have differences, we always seem to come together in tough times. This morning, we have the rare pleasure of having a Democrat and Republican appear together. So joining me now, the Republican Governor Asa Hutchinson of Arkansas, Democratic Governor Phil Murphy of New Jersey. You guys are here for the National Governors Association, which used to be sort of a, a, a powerful entity here. So, Governor Hutchinson, let me start with you. Um, in this extraordinarily divisive times, how what can you guys do to make the NGA actually effective in a bipartisan way? What's the, how do you do it? Well, first of all, I'm glad to be uh, on this show with mm -hmm. uh, Governor Murphy. He's a uh, vice chair, will next year be the chair of the NGA. For 114 years, uh, the governors have been convening in a bipartisan way to work on problems and challenges. And let me assure everyone that there's still plenty, plenty of differences. Uh, Governor Murphy and I disagree on a lot of issues, and we can fight over those. But there's so many things as governors we could work together on. And this is what's great, is that we actually gather together as governors. We meet, we discuss, we set aside the things we can't agree on. But when you're looking at infrastructure, when you're looking at computer science, which is my initiative, mm -hmm. uh, when you're looking at the challenges of COVID, we benefit from discussing and working on these things together. And it's a common voice that we can have with the administration. So it's been very productive in a bipartisan way. And I think it's a good example for America. Governor Murphy, what is realistic, though? You guys have a series of asks. What's realistic that's going to that, that can get agreed to. I, I would echo uh, much of uh, what ASA has said. Uh, I actually think the NGA is a very formidable, effective uh, organization. And I think governors have never mattered more. So if you look at the agenda this weekend, reiterate infrastructure, important across the aisle, uh, computer science education, which the chair has pioneered mm -hmm. or led on the past year, uh, COVID r response to pick three, education more broadly. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm, I'm an optimist. I think those numbers go the other way, Chuck. I think, I think we're, uh, we're going to see more commonality, more, again, not, we're not going to agree on everything. That's mm -hmm. just ne never going to happen. But I believe we're going to actually find more common ground as opposed to less. Let's talk about preparing for the next wave. And I say it this way because we don't know how big it is. We don't know how small it is. But I guess I would like to think we've, everybody's learned some lessons from what happened pre-Omicron. So if we assume we're going to hit, get hit seasonally now, what do you need in the next five months before your summer? If it is another summer surge like you dealt with, what do you think needs to be done by the federal government to let you have the tools you need to handle your summer surge? Uh, well, first of all, we're delighted to see our cases going down. Mm -hmm. uh, we just peaked last week. We hope the Omicron continues to go down. We believe that it will. And I do believe that we need to move from a pandemic status Mm -hmm. uh, and mode of operation to more endemic, where we're uh, normalizing, uh, taking it very seriously, preparing. But I think we need to move out of the panic mode. Uh, I think we uh, need to handle this to make sure that we continue with our normal lives. But the response should be, and there's two things, because we know that there will be additional right. variants coming down the way. First of all, is to continue to build the infrastructure. So for my state and other governors, we want to make sure our testing capacity is there. We want to make sure that we have access to the therapeutics. And that's where the federal government needs to step up. Uh, we need to make sure that there's a quick production. They need to rely upon the states uh, for the distribution. And right. there's a lot of uh, discussions about that. They need to improve that supply chain. So let's take advantage of this going down yeah. to be better prepared uh, around the corner. Governor Murphy, how do we not run into the testing problem we ran into pre-Omicron? You've got to pre preempt this clearly. Uh, and we're now getting caught up as a, as a country. Thankfully, our cases are going down. New mm -hmm. Jersey, New York got hit earliest on all of these waves. But I think, listen, I'm, I, I'm, I agree with Governor Hutchison. We gotta, we're not going to manage this to zero. We have to learn how to live with this. Please, God, there's not another uh, mm -hmm. significant wave. Every time you think you got this thing figured out, it humbles you. You've decided to make the booster part of a mandate. Yes. You obviously have not done any, any mandates, and I'm well aware of the politics of Arkansas. 
But look, the st- you've got a booster problem. You've had a, there's been a vaccination problem, but you've got an even bigger discrepancy uh, among political discrepancy, D's and R's, when it comes to boosters. And you've run into some problems. What, do you have a new message to try to get people to boost, get boosted? Uh, well, first of all, it is very important. I've got my boost and I'm delighted with it because I think it adds a great level of protection. And so it's education. Quite frankly, uh, the mandates that were imposed at the federal level that the Supreme Court struck down were counterproductive, as we predicted. I predicted uh, that it increased resistance. And so our vaccination rate has actually slowed. We're continuing to go up gradually. But uh, you know, the, the heavy handed approach doesn't work. It's got to be that education. It's got to be that consistent messaging. Mm-hmm. And so we want to improve those numbers. Uh, but the uh, right path is not b- by the mandate route. Why have mandates worked for you? Well, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the health care mm-hmm. mandate, and that's where we've focused. You've added the booster for and the health care, right? Tweaked it. Before the CDC has, right? Yep. yep. We t- we, absolutely. We tweaked it to add boosters, and we broadened communities. So we, we've included corrections, other vulnerable communities. Do you think mandates work? Because he, he, Governor Hutchinson doesn't think they've been counterproductive. Yeah. What say you? Well, the U- when the U.S. Supreme Court has upheld the Biden administration's step on health care, that was an easy step for us to take. And we know, as Governor Hutchison said, boosters add an enormous amount more defense mm-hmm. for you. Frankly, in New Jersey, we're underboosted. Uh, uh, getting, getting folks up, it isn't, it, it's, I think this is a national challenge. Uh, I'm, whether it's mandate or not, we've got to get more folks boosted. I want to talk about the political divide a little bit. Um, just sitting here together, you guys are going to, some might criticize you. Right. Some of the left may criticize you. Some of the right may criticize you. That will be um, the first time. For it, 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 is, it, is, it is kind of an absurd thing that this has happened. What, what's a way to fix it in Arkansas? Because it looks to me like the politics are going further to the right. And, you're, and Arkansas is going to be more divisive. Your, your likely successor is probably going to play a little bit further to the right than you. Well, the key thing is leadership. Leadership needs to set example. Uh, Phil and I, we fight in the partisan trenches in elections. Uh, We feel strongly about our respective parties. But once you get elected, you serve all the people, and you've got to find a common ground to address the problems of America and our states. And so that's setting the right example in that. Uh, That doesn't weaken us in terms of uh, the criticism or the differences of opinion. But we have to be responsible adults whenever uh, we're leading a state and we've got to implement things that impact people's lives. And so to me, it's leadership, uh, but it's also the communication. That's what the NGA does is that brings us together and we're not together enough. Governor Murphy, in the past, the governors might be an interesting group to lobby and talk about electoral reform. Is that going to be on your agenda this week? And is there a way to sort of... You, we see that some states are going off into some uncomfortable places. Is the NJ going to try to play a role here, or is this one of those issues that's too divisive? Yeah, I, I, sh- I should make one point, and NASA would will want to make this. There are 39 governors here, by the way, a big contingent from both parties. The three largest aren't, for what it's worth, Newsom, DeSantis, and Abbott. But, uh, yeah, but still, I'll, I'll yeah. take 39. Right, that's, fair uh, enough. You'd always love to have 50, uh, plus on the, the voting, on the voting question. Yeah, listen, I think that's one where there's going to be a pretty partisan debate and divide, uh, honestly. And you guys probably can't come together on anything. We're expanding it in New Jersey, and we're proud of that. We want to expand mm-hmm. it further. I know other states are taking a different approach to that. That's probably one that uh, we're going to have to agree to disagree, uh, s- sadly, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's a lot of common ground, infrastructure, education, and, and so on. Uh, what do you expect to hear from the president tomorrow? You guys are meeting with him, uh, the, the governor's ball tomorrow, right? Uh, we are. Yeah. And uh, uh, first of all, I expect to uh, uh, his administration has really been responsive on uh, questions that we've had about the infrastructure spending. I expect uh, the president to talk uh, about bipartisanship. Uh, I'd actually like to see that implemented uh, in, uh, in, in the right. policies that go forward. But uh, this is a, an annual tradition I expect will go very well. And as you said, with an infrastructure bill uh, to tell you how to implement, yeah, I imagine everybody's going to be in, the, in, the, in a pretty good mood on that mm-hmm. front. Thank you both. Appreciate it Thanks. in coming on together. When we come back, is there freedom of speech on college campuses? Depends on whom you ask. That's next. Welcome back. Data download time. The increasingly common public debate over free speech took a few different forms this week. But whether you're talking about podcasts on Spotify or books in Tennessee classrooms, 
The issue remains. Americans are divided over what, when, where, and how things can or can't be said. And nowhere is this debate more apparent than on college campuses. These days, the importance of free speech in our democracy. Students almost uniformly agree on the importance here. 84% of all students. You look in demographic breakdowns, there's really barely a difference between white, non-white, male, female when it comes to the importance of free speech. Now, when it comes to the issue of how secure free speech is in this country, well, a couple years ago, there were majorities of Democrats, independents, and Republican students who all felt that free speech was pretty secure in this country. Two years later, the numbers haven't changed among Democrats here, but look at this. Down almost 50% among Republican students, double digit here among independents who believe free speech in this country is not as secure as it was two years ago. And this extends in some places on college campuses themselves. Is the school's climate? Is it stifling free expression? 2016, half of students thought it did, 54%. Five years later, it's up even more, 65%. Now look, that doesn't mean that some students don't believe there should be some curbing of some speech. So for instance, there's a majority that believe colleges should be able to restrict offensive racial slurs. But go down. How about close with Confederate flags? Only a third believe that college campuses should do this. And what about presidential candidate posters? Even less than that at 10%. So this issue of free speech is something that students care about and with their experiences on campuses these days are worried about. When we come back, Pentagon officials are warning that Russia has enough troops to move far into Ukraine. So why does Ukraine's government say the U.S. is overstating the Russian threat? Stay with us. As you know, for months now, Russia has been deploying forces to Crimea and along Ukraine's border, including in Belarus. While we don't believe that President Putin has made a final decision to use these forces against Ukraine, he clearly now has that capability. Carol Lee, those were some pretty striking words by the Secretary of Defense. Very straightforward. And it was almost a, a bit alarming yeah. at how... and. I think you and I were talking about this the other day. It almost felt like they were taunting Putin. Like, okay, you've got everything. What are you going to do? Look, if you talk to administration officials, there's a growing concern. And particularly, you heard the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Milley, say that they haven't seen anything of this magnitude. You'd have to go back way into the Cold War. And that what Russia has done in terms of building up around Ukraine, in terms of air power, mm -hmm. ballistic missiles, you know, 100,000 100, ground troops, that that is something that could become horrific was the word that he used. And I, what they're trying to do is is essentially lay the groundwork for something that, that people in the administration, some of them really genuinely believe could take place. And at the same time, then you see the president of Ukraine, right. Zelensky, taking a very different tone. And what I've been told by administration officials is that's not the Ukrainians' view in private conversations. Right. They're much more sober about this. And he has a domestic audience to play to. He has to worry about his economy falling. And he has to worry about people panicking. And the administration, one of the interesting things about this is if you just look at the Afghanistan example, they were criticized for not pulling people out right. of the embassies. Mm -hmm. And they made that decision. They didn't want to undermine the government. Now they're kind of taking a different tact in a very different environment and, and sounding alarms and moving some folks, families of diplomats out of Ukraine. And yet Eugene Zelensky was upset that we're, we were shipping out our embassy already. Like, hey, stop sending that message. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he wants uh, to keep his uh, approval ratings high. He wants to keep his uh, people believing that things are safe and not uh, panicking. Uh, but he also wants our help if things get out of control. And he needs uh, Western allies to be available to push back on Russia if they move forward because they can't protect themselves without our help. Steve, it feels like we're trying to figure out, is Putin a rational actor? Right. That's a good question. I mean, I think when, when we look at this from our perspective, we look at the things he's doing and say this doesn't make sense. And you see a lot of that in, in reporting the media. But go back and look at what Vladimir Putin has been saying over all these years. Go back to speeches that he was giving in the, in the mid-aughts. He was telling us what he wants to do. Mm -hmm. He wants to reconstitute the Russian Empire, the old, old Soviet Union. When you have autocratic leaders like that tell you what they want to do, you're smart to pay attention. The problem, I think, from the Biden administration, uh, from, from my perspective about the Biden administration, is this alarm comes a little bit too late. It's not like these 100,000 troops 
just went to the border. They've been there for a long time, and you've had I think, Republicans and conservatives raising alarms mm-hmm. about what Putin was up to, pointing out the kinds of assets, military assets, that were in position months ago. Mm-hmm. And the Biden administration seems to be just catching up. Claire? Well, first of all, I, I think Putin, you have to assume he's rational. He may be irrational. And if I were to look, I would say he's trying to mine the divisions within NATO right now. He's trying to exacerbate the Germany being an outlier and being worried about being all in against him. He wants to highlight Macron making noises. That's the assumption that he's rational. Yeah, that he's trying to to make NATO not a strong alliance Mm -hmm. by playing this card at this time. And the other thing I got to say is you said Republicans. The other thing that's happening here. It is amplifying a divide in the Republican Party. I mean, when you've got people on the Fox cable news network. I mean, it's Tucker Carlson. Look, he's being used. I could show you some clips here. He's being used on RT. No, no, no. He's being used by RT, the Mm -hmm. propaganda arm of of Putin. Yes. All the time now here. It's The Republicans are loving up on Putin right now. A bunch of them. Some of them. What's this about? What is this about? A bunch of them. Donald Trump did this earlier, right? He did this throughout his presidency. He was very warm in his rhetoric toward Vladimir Putin, even if his policies were, I think, tougher in many respects than than certainly than Joe Biden's. The, the challenge is he's trying to to exploit these divisions. He's doing it in, in NATO on an international scale. Mm-hmm. Uh, it wasn't helpful, I think, when the president said, talked about NATO divisions almost as an analyst, like he were here with us on, on the on the round table. Spoke honestly. I mean, yeah. honestly, but what Rob yeah. Portman said in his conversation with you was a lot more appropriate for a, a, a leader of a country like the United States to say, look, we're doing what we can to bring NATO together. And on, on the domestic side, there's no question that Republicans are divided on this. And, and I think you have Republicans saying irresponsible things about Vladimir Putin, yeah. uh, pretending that he's not the threat that it's he is. It's a virus is. that's growing. That's what Part it of like. the reason that you're seeing this alarm right now is because the window is closing for any sort of diplomatic resolution that if you look at the timeline in terms of when Putin would evade, but the administration looks at mid February to the end of March, that's when the, this would happen. And so there's a very limited amount of time for diplomacy. I thought Senator Durbin's comment to you is very interesting and that he was putting this on the Ukrainians. Why don't you just yeah. say you won't join NATO? And I talked to an administration official over the weekend about this and they're not going to touch that, at least not publicly. Nope. But, you know, it, the other question is, would it be enough? It. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, that's an interesting question. That I don't have time to deal with here. That's all we have for today. Thank you for watching. Wait, next week, as the Olympics get underway, I'm not going to jinx the Bengals or the Chiefs by saying go to either one of them. Or the Bills and the Packers are out. But either way, enjoy today's games. We'll see you next Sunday. See how to do it. If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast, free wherever you get your podcasts.